Douglas's press, press conference, latest on Build Back Better Opportunities for Guam. With us today are Guam Media Partners. Thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, Guam's representative to the U.S. Congress, Congressman Michael Sinicholas. Uh, thank you to our media partners for joining us on our press conference this evening on the Build Back Better agenda that is now officially with the Committee on Rules uh, to pass the House and, uh, and, of course, likewise to be considered in the Senate. Um, Real-time update as of, as of this evening, um, voting on the Committee on Rules version has been suspended until next week. Um, but we are comfortable calling this press conference to be able to discuss the items contained in the um, bill um, as pertains to because of the uh, of intense negotiations of the past almost two months. Um, we're, we're pretty certain that the items that are in the package at this time are likely going to be retained in the package. And so we wanted to, of course, share them with our media partners and through your channels, your listening audiences of the people of Guam. Uh, first, I'd like to um, uh, begin by uh, kind of going over what we discussed when the package initially rolled out and um, basically reiterate what has been retained based on what we shared initially. Um, first, on that on that list was the um, funding for um, infrastructure, particularly uh, for a new hospital. We're very pleased to uh, announce that the funding for that um, that originated in the Natural Resources Committee has been retained. And so uh, if we pass this bill, it's very likely that Guam will have approximately $345 million uh, in infrastructure um, funding made available through the Department of Interior. Uh, it will be itemized um, in a general basis for what is labeled as critical infrastructure, uh, but the intent of the funding, um, the, the, the rationale behind it was specifically for um, providing for uh, resources for new hospital construction. Uh, so that 345 million for Guam, about 1 billion for territories in general, uh, but 345 million uh, as Guam's portion is looking like it's going to be retained in the original language. We're also very pleased to announce that the financial services components uh, have also been retained. That's $70 million in community development block grants a 10 times increase over what was allotted for territories in the past, which was just $7 million. Of that increase, uh, Guam used to receive 3.1 million out of the 7 million. And so mathematically, we can anticipate to receive 31 million out of the 70 million. Uh, CDBG funds can be used for a wide range of activities such as housing rehabilitation, code enforcement, acquisition of real property for public use, a demolition of, of properties for public use, infrastructure and public facility improvements, economic development and social services. The primary eligibility for any activity to be funded is that the project or program principally benefits low and moderate income persons in designated census tracts. Additionally, to help us with our housing circumstances on Guam, we have 9.6 million uh, out of a 10 billion funding pool that's going to be going to public housing capital fund allocation. So 9.6 million for Guam, another 27.5 million in home investment partnerships and 18.7 million in the housing trust fund. Of those three um, funding pools, the 9 million, the 27 million, the 18 million, all three of them are basically going to be eligible for low income housing projects. So we're going to be able to um, dramatically increase our housing inventory with those funds. Those funds can be used to, um, of course, build inventory. Uh, they can be used to uh, provide uh, down payment assistance for low income families. Uh, they can also be used to provide rental assistance for those um, outside of the Section 8 program. Additionally, um, and this is a really big one, uh, we were able to uh, secure a $3.5 billion pool for all of, of the country, uh, but Guam is also eligible to apply for that pool, and this is for Section 811 and Section 202 funding, and this 
funding basically will be allowed for uh, senior citizen housing and for housing for people with disabilities. So we have a significant uh, amount of funding for housing and we have a significant amount of funding for uh, community development block grants um, that are very, very flexible for uh, various infrastructure and community development needs for the territory. There is an additional um, school infrastructure funding um, outlying areas are going to be receiving about 410 million of that. And so Guam, we, we generally receive about one third of the allotted sum. So we're looking at an estimated $150 million um, in uh, school infrastructure funding. Um, we can either use that, of course, to uh, fund uh, school development. We have outstanding projects. Uh, number one on the list, of course, is Simon Sanchez. Uh, we can also use that funding to address the um, overall capital improvement project needs throughout the school system, which was approximately, I believe, uh, $50 million as identified by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and on top of all of that, uh, we also have uh, the Medicaid matching funding of 83% to 17% being permanized, uh, as well as a increase in the, uh, in the um, uh, allotted federal funding for that program. We're going to have an extension of the child tax credit uh, for another year. So all of our families will be able to avail of that. We're going to see a, a, an increase in support for child care for families. So if you're a household that makes less than $300,000 a year, which is most of our households on Guam, and um, you have four children, um, um, as an example, your housing, your, your child care expenses should not exceed 7% of your income coming in. And so there will be federal support for um, child care subsidies uh, if it exceeds 7% of your um, gross household income, uh, up to $300,000 for, uh, for a household. There's also tuition subsidies for students from territories that will allow for our students um, who want to attend university in the, in the mainland. Um, anything above the tuition rates that they assess at the University of Guam or the Guam Community College will also be receiving federal subsidies. And a major breakthrough that we had that uh, I thought was incredibly important to share, and I'm just so overwhelmed that, that, that the language has made it in, is um, we have secured supplemental security income for the territories. Um, that's going to basically make SSI available for Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, and uh, the US Virgin Islands. This is something that we've been working on since day one of when we took office. And we were able to, um, we we're just so happy to see the language was able to make its way into this, into this package, this negotiated package. And so that's an update on um, the Build Back Better agenda. Uh, basically in a nutshell, the original items that we um, initially shared with, with our media partners and with our people uh, have been retained. And in addition to that, we're looking at being able to see uh, supplemental security income uh, as part of the final package. That's pretty much the nutshell. I, I know that's very brief. Uh, I'll go ahead and pause and allow for our media partners um, to present any questions that they may have. Thank you very much, Congressman. I will go ahead and ask the media partners, please indicate that they have a question by using the raise your hand icon. Where's that at? Raise my hand icon. Um, or turn yeah. in that you'd like to yeah. At the bottom of the Zoom screen under reactions, there's a raise hand icon. Oh, sorry. thanks, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, first question is for questions is John O'Connor. John O'Connor, you're recognized for your question. Thank you, Congressman. I was wondering if you can talk about how the Medicaid share was decided. It was 83, 17, I think you said. So how, how were you able to decide that rate? That's actually what was passed previously, about, I believe it was two years ago. Um, the 8317 uh, matching was, was what was initially passed um, when we got this a couple of years ago. So it's basically um, an extension of that. 
that initial um, matching rate was uh, on a on a um, two year basis, and this is basically going to push it into an extended, uh, I believe, eight year basis, which puts it basically in line of how often Medicaid gets reviewed uh, and reauthorized in the Congress throughout the country. So um, that's how the 8317 was determined. It's actually a previous figure, um, but this is putting it on a schedule that is consistent with uh, how often Medicaid gets reviewed uh, congressionally and, and reauthorized. So we're, we're, we're confident that it's going to be a, um, a permanent, basically a permanent fix to our Medicaid situation. And what's the amount that Guam will have uh, for the, uh, the federal amount that they will be able to provide us? I will need to get back to you on that final amount. I know that we presented an amount when we initially made our um, presentation a couple of months ago, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and task the team to just re-verify whether that amount has, has been um, re-secured. Uh, so we'll, we'll get back to you guys on, on what the, uh, the total, we'll get back to you guys on, on what the, uh, the total federal annual funding is going to be. I'll pass it on to uh, someone else. Thank you. Thank you, John. Congressman, now recognizing Chris Warnett for Hi, Congressman. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for the update. It was very informative. Sure, sure thing. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, 345 million. So I'm sure you're aware the governor is trying to take 300 mil from the ARP to build her uh, hospital. If, if this Build Back Better goes through, uh, do you anticipate that that, that money? could be used to build the hospital and just, I guess, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's, that's what we're hoping. Uh, we're hoping that um, by providing this 345 million federally, um, that 300 million that uh, the governor has been setting aside could then be reprogrammed into actually funding more relief, more COVID relief for our people. Um, that's the, the, that was the actual intent for why those funds were provided to the state and local governments. So I'm hoping that you know, as we as this 345 million materializes, we can see 300 million in, in relief make its way out from that withholding that the governor has been doing. And there's a lot of things that can be done with that. You know, yeah. um, we we we've never done anything for essential workers. So if we're looking for a, a pool to do that, that's definitely something that can do that. Um, we also could, of course, provide more subsidies to help businesses uh, employ people and, and begin ramping up our workforce development to get us ready for tourism reopening. We've heard some positive signs coming in from GVB that, um, that you know, there's, there's hope that we might see um, some, some improvements on our, on our, at least our, our Korean visitor arrivals. Uh, but of course, the, 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 um, Professionals in the industry have communicated that if our workforce is is lagging, then we're going to have a, a a tourism a visitor experience that is that is um, lacking, and we don't want that either. So if we can if we can use some of those funds as well to, to to incentivize bringing those employees back into the workforce, especially because we no longer have unemployment assistance coming in, um, that will be very beneficial as well. So uh, yeah, there's there's um you know a whole a whole host of things that that 300 million can be used for, and there certainly isn't a shortage of need. So we're hoping that you know by being able to secure that 345 million federally, we can free up that 300 million that's been set aside for for the relief programs that are so desperately needed on the island. It's got to be frustrating for you, Congressman, because I, I know that you did a, another Zoom press conference with Speaker Theresa Lai, and he kind of laid out like the roadmap basically of everything that we can use these ARP funds for. And I don't think the governor's uh, doing any of that uh, with the money. So how, how frustrating is that for you? Uh, you guys do the work in Congress, you get us this, this historic level of, of federal funding and support. And then, you know, come to find out it's sitting in a bank for the most part since May. I think that the frustration we have is that is, is shared uh, at large by the community and also by local lawmakers. Um, of course, as you mentioned, Chris, we presented options and what can be done with the funds. Uh, the speaker and the legislature have absolutely presented um, a whole host of things that they believe could be um, uh, supported with the funds. Um, and, and there's just been, you know, a lot of businesses as well reaching out saying, hey, you know, can we get support for um, our particular areas, um, especially because you know, like for example, the restaurant relief fund still hasn't been um, uh, re, re, um, recharged federally. Can we use some of these funds for our, um, our restaurant industry? And, and I know that there's also other local tourism uh, operators who are wanting additional support. So that there, there definitely is frustration. Um, 
you know, and 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 when we when we continue to to make these resources available, and um, and the administration uh, does not, you know, take full advantage of them, we we, we sit back and we wonder why, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, this is a ripe opportunity to to really uh, roll things out and and get people to. You know, re, re, restart the economy, get the get the confidence uh, in the business community um, where it needs to be, and um, yeah, it's, it, it's it's absolutely frustrating. Um, but there's only so much we can do, and and I'm hoping that as we continue to just layer, um, you know, support on top of support on top of support, it just kind of causes the um, the uh, the resistance from the administration to kind of collapse under the weight of all of that support, and finally just start doing what they're supposed to be doing with the funding. Right, it, uh, and I mean, it's so confusing because I mean, obviously you're the congressman and you would know about you know the uses of this money. And then when you come out and, and for example, you're meeting with the mayors, you came out and you said, hey, there's all this money that's available to you guys. But then the administration shoots back and they, there's a quote from Lester, Lester Carlson. He says the assertion by the congressman and Senator Moylan that 32 million was available to the mayors was totally unfounded and unsupported. So again, it's like, you come out and you say these things and people get excited about it and then it just gets shut down at, at the front office. Yeah, we were actually very disappointed to hear that report from Lester because they know full well that they're in the American Rescue Plan, there's a whole breakdown of, of state and local support that was received. And so the 32 million that Guam Guam received is consistent with the, um, uh, you know, they keep saying, oh, it's for counties. And it's like, look, the, the point is that those funds were received for local units of government. And so that, and so, you know, if, if the spirit of the law is for you to use that on the villages, then use that on the villages. And I know they're turning around and they're saying, oh, but there's another funding source for the villages and that's the non-entitlement units, the NEU that they were referring to. Mm -hmm. But what they, weren't, what they weren't upfront about, Chris, was that that NEU funding is also available to all the other jurisdictions that received um, their their uh, their county funding. So the CNMI, you know, they got money for Saipan, Rhoda, Tinian, and they got money for NEU funding. So there's two pools. There's a 32 million for the quote unquote counties, and there's that 17 million for the NEUs. So you know, I I don't know why there's resistance to making money available or or, or trying to to hoard it for, you know, who, who's gonna be able to use it and, and make decisions with it. There's more than enough to go around. And we really, we really should just be focusing on getting the resources into the hands of those who can put it to the highest and best use the fastest, because, you know, everyone, everyone's waiting for relief and there's yeah. just been such, such a slow, um, a slow output of, of relief getting into the hands of where it needs to go. So. Um, yeah, uh, there's frustration. There's um, all kinds of different interpretations. All we can do on our end is kind of present what's there and then just focus on, on, on trying to secure whatever else we can and allow for, you know, allow for the, um, the truth to, to basically reveal itself and, and, and things start turning out the way they ultimately will. Congressman, if you don't mind, I just had one more. Uh, so the LEAP program, which is the, I forget what it stands for, but it's basically the uh, businesses. I went to the governor and they said, hey, Gov, we know you have the ARP funding. They were asking for $75 million, uh, but the governor agreed to $50 million, but she's only using $25 million of the ARP. And now there's a bill where they're trying to somehow find another $25 million out of the general fund when, I mean, like you said, she could have full well given them the whole 75 from the ARP. Yeah, that, she can. I don't know why she isn't. We DOE already came out, and, and I know that you caught this, Chris. DOE came out already, not even one month into the fiscal year, and said that they're 25 million short. You know, so so all of this trying to to um, um, you know for some find find some reason not to use federal money while tapping into you know local local um uh, revenue streams that are under high strain it it really doesn't make any sense that the 75 million absolutely is there and that's not including the 300 million set aside getting this 345 million and and allowing for that 300 million set aside to, to even further flood into the into the economy i mean there really is no reason to 
you know, not give out 75 million and ultimately turn 75 into 25. It just, it's just, I don't understand it, but it's just the way things are at this time. Well, Congressman, thank you. And I think it's definitely revealing that uh, you've got more insight into how much we're struggling from all the way over there. And I just wish that same insight was uh, being seen by uh, downtown. So thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Chris. Chris, Congressman, next in the question order is John Titano. Morning, Congressman. Thanks for the update this morning. Uh, you know, uh, just listening over to everything that you listed, it, I know the uh, reconciliation package got cut basically in half, but um, it sounds like everything more or less that was secured for Guam uh, was in there. Were there any casualties? Is that the case? We are looking at potentially one casualty, um, and uh, we're, we're just waiting to verify that it is in fact, but it, it's something that I've been told it has been a casualty. And that's the 20 million in, um, in bus shelter funding that we were hoping to secure um, and as part of the transportation component. Um, we, we lumped that 20 million, there was, a, there was a part of the whole package development where the Congress basically reached out to all the members and they said, hey, give us your member designated projects. Give us what you want to fund as a specific project in your districts. And so I came back and I, and I put all of my, um, my weight behind getting the bus shelters for um, our transportation system. Unfortunately, as part of, as you mentioned, the reduction in the, in the, in the price tag of the um, overall package, the Congress cut out all of the member designated projects. So of course ours was one of them. And unfortunately it looks like the $20 million bus shelter component might not be um, in, the, uh, in, the final, in the final component. And so that's unfortunately one item that we may, we may have to do without um, despite all the other items we were able to secure. Well, well, along those lines, actually, um, we haven't heard about this in a while. I know the uh, DRT was trying to get um, funding. It might have been through the infrastructure package, but it was a real ambitious proposal, something like 100 buses. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what's the status about that. We haven't gotten an update in a while. I haven't heard of, um, so, so the 100 buses is going to be funded in part by, um, uh, there's three different uh, transit and transportation grants that are definitely getting um, uh, filled in with additional funding. Uh, I know that, that, that those uh, grant pools still are getting funded. Uh, I don't have in front of me what those funding levels are. So my policy team is on the line. Um, if they can go ahead and uh, you know, track back on, on whether or not that transit funding is getting filled the same volume. Uh, but I believe that's where they were looking at getting the, hundred, um, the, the funding for the 100 buses. Uh, but uh, assuming that the funding was reduced, it still is an overall pool and applications are supposed to come in into that pool. And um, a lot of the language was structured for it to be need based, particularly for communities, excuse me, that do not have public transportation. And so um, Guam is still, I think, going to be um, based on that on that criteria is still going to be on the on the top of the list for for um, uh, getting its its needs funded. So the the funding pool, long story short, the funding pool for, for where that 100 buses was going to come from may be reduced, but that reduction might not necessarily result in a reduction in the, in, in the buses being procured. So we're going to track back on that number, um, but I still believe that it's going to be substantial enough for the 100 bus target to still be um, uh, um, something that can be attainable. You know what, I'll go ahead and uh, hold off for uh, until next round. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Congressman, next in the question order is Jerry Zartino with PNC. Yes, uh, Congressman, uh, <clears throat> are the Democrats finally uh, united on this bill? I read earlier that there was some opposition from some Democrats, which uh, contributed to the delay, right? So uh, what's the status now? Is, are, are, is there a consensus now? What I can say is that the items that are in the bill now are items that the administration and the leadership believe they have um, the votes necessary to be able to achieve. Um, but what I also further understand is that there may be um, uh, some additional components that uh, certain members may want to still have entertained. And there still is an effort by some members to um, put some additional or some clarification components into the bill in order to make their support um, uh, more ironclad. So um, 
I, I, I'm, I want to say, I want to say that we have the votes to be able to move the legislation forward. And I also want to say that uh, we can confidently expect what we already have in there to be retained. Um, and that's why I'm comfortable having the press conference and talking about it. But you're right, there is still, uh, um, there is still uh, um, some headwinds and uh, there, we're working through those headwinds. And that is why the, the voting has not been concluded yet. Uh, and we're looking at concluding that um, next week. But the mere fact that these items are in, in the package that we have and that this package is now with the Rules Committee and it is being deliberated gives me the confidence to be able to say that we likely have um, the votes necessary uh, in both chambers, at least for these components that we're talking about. Um, um, because they've already survived a very rigorous round of negotiations, I'm not too worried that there may be um, a risk to these components if there are any additional tweaks at this time. But if there are any changes, I'll be sure to let you guys know right away. Okay, Congressman, you said uh, both chambers, right? So uh, uh, it's likely that this will pass. Uh, if, if this bill passes the House, it's likely that it will also pass the Senate, right? That's what you're saying? Or? What I can say is, again, because the negotiations have been so rigorous, there isn't anything in this bill that hasn't already been seen by both chambers. And the House isn't going to want to pass something that is just going to get torn apart in the Senate at this time. We've already spent so much time negotiating. Um, there's been a lot of um, uh, very big picture frustration um, just, uh, just at large um, in, in trying to find a, a healthy middle ground. Um, and so because what, we're, what we have in the package now is kind of becoming public and being considered, there is nothing in there that I know both chambers haven't seen. And there is nothing in there that I believe would be put in there um, knowing, knowing that there would have been resistance to it on the Senate side. So this is something that I think we can confidently look forward to. Um, again, it's just cautious optimism at this time, though. Nothing is done until it's done. Um, but but we're, we're kind of on a track for it to be um, at a probability level that I can confidently bring it back to you guys and say, this is what we're looking at. And this is what I think will likely happen. Okay, uh, one last question for me, uh, Congressman. Uh, there, there is also this uh, comprehensive social policy bill out there. Does that, uh, does that uh, legislation have uh, anything to offer Guam? I believe that a lot of the components of that is actually being included in this reconciliation package uh, from the child care component to the extension of the child tax credit. Um, there's just a lot of social pro programs that are being touched in, in this current reconciliation package. Um, as for any additional legislation, I'm not confident um, discussing uh, any of those any of those packages because I don't have a, a pulse on whether or not there is um, the traction necessary for them to be successful. So I'm only comfortable at this time discussing what we're bringing up in terms of the reconciliation and the Build Back Better agenda, which is the items that we talked about here in, in this press conference. Okay, thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Jerry. Congressman, that concludes the first round of questions. If there are no further questions for the first round, we'll go ahead and recognize John O'Connor for round two of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I did want to follow up on the um, some of the transportation aspects of this of this bill. Can you you did mention the twenty million was potential casualty? Can you go over some of the um, the transportation projects or the infrastructure projects that are funded through this bill, and uh, what what how much funding and to what projects they apply to for Guam? Well, on the on the uh, on the infrastructure side, there were um, three main components um, that we were focusing on. Um, two of them were in mass transit, and one of them was in highway funding. The um, transit component was, of course, the bus shelters, which um, unfortunately was not um, did not survive. Um, the other component is the um, the uh, grant funding for the uh, the electric buses, uh, which. Uh, has survived, but uh, at, a, at a funding pool that we still need to, to finalize uh, as we review the bill. But we're confident that the Guam needs are still going to be able to be met with that final sum. 
And the third component, of course, was the highway funding. And uh, to my knowledge, the um, highway funding uh, increase from 17 million to 45 million. Uh, I believe it has survived um, the bill, but I'm also tagging my policy team on that one uh, to give me confirmation on that. That, that was not part of my uh, itemized list that I brought up. But aside from, aside from those areas, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the, um, uh, the financial services side that covers the infrastructure component for housing, um, all of those have survived, including the CDBG, um, 70 million, 31 million for Guam. Um, those are all areas that have uh, continued to make it through onto this uh, next portion of the bill. But um, as for the transportation, we lost the bus shelters. We're still looking at the pooling for the for the electric buses, but we're confident Guam's still going to be able to fund our our full need based on what that final pool is looking like. And to my knowledge, I believe that the highway funding has been retained. But if I get any contrary indications on that, I'll be sure to let you guys know. And, and you did talk earlier about, I, I believe you mentioned child tax credit. Can you go over that again and what exactly that means for Guam? It's basically an extension of what we're, what we're enjoying today, um, but extending it into the next uh, uh, calendar year. And so um, going into 2022, we're going to continue to see, to see uh, the child tax credit payouts that have been coming out from the federal government uh, over the past few months. We're going to be able to continue to see an extension of that into 2022. So that's not a, it's not a permanent reoccurring thing for Guam? It's not a permanent reoccurring thing for anywhere in the country. Um, but they have extended it out for another year, and uh, I'm sure that over the course of that period in time, um, we will continue to revisit that as a body. Uh, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of appetite to uh, to make that be a permanent thing. Um, the issue at this juncture has been the um, the uh, <clears throat> the funding levels, but um, this time next year we're going to be doing another budget reconciliation process all over again, and that's going to give us a, a third bite at the apple for some of these things that may have only been extended for a short period uh, to potentially be reconsidered for a, a more longer term extension. So to clarify, um, the one year extension of the child tax credit that's in this bill is not just uh, um, for Guam, it's for the whole country. Uh, so that one year timeline expiration likewise will be for the whole country unless we extend it uh, in a future package. Okay, and this last question is unrelated, but you have expressed uh, your intention an intention to run for governor in the past. Have you made a final, have you finalized that decision yet? Well, uh, you know, Chris brought up a lot of, a lot of points on why we need to be, I mean, why that, that, that option is actually on the table and why there's a lot of community frustration um, wanting that option to be considered. We're, we're continuing to, of course, do the work that we have to out here in the Congress and secure the um, provisions that are gonna be beneficial for our community, regardless of what our ultimate decision is. Uh, but but again, as, as long as the administration continues to um, not meet the public's expectation and not utilize these resources in a manner that's going to um, situate our people and our community uh, in, in a much better place than we are, um, then that's going to compel um, anybody who has a public service, um, anybody who's committed to public service to, to, to consider making that kind of a commitment in order to remedy what is obviously um, an execution problem. So uh, at this juncture, um, as we continue to tick off our, um, our goals uh, congressionally, um, that of course gives us um, even more um, weight to say, hey, you know what? It's, it's looking like it's time for us to go home and, and, and actually fix the source of the problem when it comes to getting the help to our people because it's not a resource problem at this point. And um, if, if we gotta be the solution for that, we absolutely will be. Uh, as for any, any announcements, we're not, we're not making any announcements at this time, uh, but we continue to monitor the situation. And you know, uh, the, I, from my last conversation of when we said we're considering it, the deck is continuing to stack in that, on that, on that end. Uh, higher and higher because our messaging is just is just not resonating. It's things are not getting better. Things are not moving faster. Relief is not getting to our people. Frustration continues to build, and so in, in, until that until that trend reverses, and if, as that debt continues to stack higher, it's going to continue to weigh heavily on the fact that we may be actually making that move. Okay, so it sounds like a strong consideration, but not yet a confirmation at this time. Thank you, Congress.
<laughs> Thank you, John. Next up in the question order, we've got Joe Titano. Uh, Congressman, you mentioned the uh, funding for child care expansion for families on Guam. I think um, one provision that was in there before was a uh, it kind of expanded um, uh, access to universal pre-K. Um, is that still going to be in there? And I was wondering if you could just kind of talk about uh, the program a little bit more. Yes, if you can just give me one minute, because um, you are correct, and I want to make sure I, 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 um, I, I talk about it properly. If you can give me one second here to, to, to re-reference what you're discussing. Yes. Yeah, so the the um, the bill also um, expands universal preschool for all three and four year olds. It'll expand access to free high quality preschool for more than six million children across the country, and this is going to be funded for a six year time frame. And so Guam will be included in in universal pre K um, funding for three and four year olds into our public school system. And as far as the expanded child care access, um, I'm sorry, I think you said um, everybody passed 7%, uh, uh, everything passed 7%? Yes, it will limit child care costs for families to no more than 7% of income for families earning up to 250% of state median income. So whatever the median income is on Guam, I believe it's in the low 40,000s. But anywhere um, for families earning up to 250% of state median income, your child care expenses should not exceed 7% of your income. And so if it does, then federal subsidies will kick in to make sure that you're able to um, reduce your child costs, child care costs to only 7% of your income. That's also going to be funded for six years. And uh, I know it was a big announcement just this morning. Uh, we got uh, SSIs extended to the territories or to Guam as well. Um, I'm just wondering, is that going to be the full amount or are we going to be uh, kind of at an equal level with all the states? And is this going to be on a permanent basis as well? Yes, the way the language is structured and we looked at it very carefully, SSI was being denied to territories because statutorily it was written into the law to not include us. What they're doing in this bill and what the language is reading is that they're removing those statutory exclusions so that it extends to the territories on a full equal basis and on a permanent basis um, uh, uh, compared to the rest of the country. There's also additional language in there that authorizes the secretary to be able to make to, to be able to waive whatever statutory restrictions may impede um, SSI being fully applicable to the territories um, due to our territorial conditions. And so everything has been included to be able to allow for the SSI program to be fully extended on a permanent basis with any unforeseen um, uh, statutorily, statutorial, statutorial statutes, um, unforeseen, unforeseen statutory restrictions being able to be um, um, mitigated um, at the discretion of the secretary. So yes, we're gonna get SSI and yes, it's going to be uh, compared to the rest of the country on a permanent basis. And, uh, you know, along with uh, Medicaid, I know SSI, that's been a real long battle um, that a lot of people have been fighting uh, locally and um, out there in DC. I'm just wondering, uh, we got it announced this morning, what was kind of the background? Like, how, can you speak a little bit about how we finally managed to get that attached? I, I think it's a confluence of circumstances. Um, there is a, a Supreme Court case right now um, uh, initiated by a, a, a plaintiff in Puerto Rico um, that is reviewing um, the applicability of SSI to all territories uh, as a blanket um, a concern of that particular Supreme Court case. Um, attorney generals across the country to include our attorney general have submitted um, briefs in support of that. Um, I do know that um, Equally American, the nonprofit organization, has also submitted some um, uh, amicus briefs on that and, and has been advocating also to um, uh, have some kind of policy or um, uh, judicial remedy to the SSI question. There's been a lot of work on it congressionally. Um, I want to, of course, recognize um, my colleagues in the Hispanic Caucus. They all unanimously voted to support a letter that we transmitted to all leadership um, in the House and the Senate. Um, Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer to uh, make sure that um, that option was considered. Uh, I want to thank uh, Governor Pedro Luisi of Puerto Rico, who also endorsed a letter 
um, supporting SSI for our territories. Um, and also our speaker, I actually, I had a personal phone conversation with her and I told her as a matter of speaker, when I first got into the Congress and we were first um, situating um, our party for leadership, I told you that this was um, the, the number one priority that I had. And here we are in this reconciliation opportunity. And I really feel like it's our one and only you know, shot to be able to do this. And, and she was very receptive. And um, obviously with her support, we have the language in the bill at this time. Uh, Leader Schumer uh, in the Senate was someone we also had a very direct conversation with that was facilitated by um, a Hispanic caucus meeting that he uh, attended and, and took questions from uh, the membership. And, and I, I wanna thank my chairman Raul Ruiz uh, in the Hispanic caucus for giving us an opportunity to directly um, request uh, Leader Schumer's support. And he was very open. He said, send us your packet, uh, send us the details, and um, we'll see what, you know, we'll see how we can work things. Uh, and then, you know, the first uh, confluence of circumstances, the Congressional Budget Office um, scored the, um, the cost of SSI. Um, when they reviewed it in this round, they scored it and it came in at a price point um, that, you know, given the overall dollar um, value of the, of the package, was something that uh, was was not out of range, um, given the big picture of things. So, um, and, and then of course, um, we brought the issue to um, Vice President Harris directly when we had our meeting with her uh, with the Asia Pacific American Caucus. Um, and again, uh, we were fortunate to um, be invited to her residence uh, a couple of months ago, um, this time also with the Hispanic Caucus. Um, and we did, uh, uh, we did make a, an effort to, again, broach the subject with her directly uh, as a reminder. So there's just been a lot of, a lot of effort um, from various parties, uh, a lot of weight put on the issue judicially, uh, congressionally, uh, on an advocacy basis. And um, I, I'll, be, I'll be quite frank, when, when my team mentioned to me that, that with the language is in there, um, I was kind of overwhelmed uh, um, emotionally because it was something that uh, is, is very um, near and dear to my heart. And it was one of the main reasons why I ran for this office to begin with. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, and of course, but by the grace of God, you know, all, all those pieces somehow, some way came together to have that language, that very critical piece of language for so many in our community um, finally make its way into this bill. And we're just, we are, we are, just completely overwhelmed by it, and 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 we're we're very very we're very very hopeful that this is going to finally put the issue to rest um, when we get this bill um, in its final version and passed. And you know, uh, one last question that kind of leads me into um, I don't want to count all our ducks before we hatch, but we, we finally got uh, the political will uh, behind this to get this attached to like a major piece of legislation. Um, does that set any precedent? Is there any possibility moving forward for another issue that? kind of need that kind of support on um, uh, being, uh, you know, the insular cases and extending, say, uh, uh, the plebiscite to the territories. Is there, does this uh, bode well for the island in kind of that sense? Uh, well, just to be clear, there's nothing federally restricting us from having a plebiscite uh, that, that involves all of the voters of Guam. Um, I know that the restrictions that were kind of having to struggle with is whether or not it's going to be um, a tomorrow only plebiscite. I don't see that changing um, congressionally or judicially. Um, the United States is, is founded on universal suffrage. Um, there isn't a single territory in the United States that is pursuing um, a plebiscite um, that's limiting who can vote. Puerto Rico's plebiscites have always been at large. Everybody can vote. They didn't limit it to the Taino in Indians of Puerto Rico. They let everybody vote. So I don't see um, any kind of legislative or judicial remedy that would um, in any way allow for a, a plebiscite that doesn't allow everyone to vote. I think that's something that we need to come to terms with. Um, the, the, the courts have already ruled that they're not going to allow for a um, uh, a vote that doesn't include everybody and the Supreme Court said we're not even going to entertain uh, any kind of appeals about that. I mean, that's 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 pretty final. And so I think the, the, the ball is in our court now. We need to come to terms with the fact, are we going to let everybody vote or not? If not, then we're probably not going to be having a vote at all or anytime soon. And if we are going to let everybody vote, then we can do that at any time. 
So we don't have any federal restrictions on having a plebiscite other than the fact that we need to let everybody vote if we have one. And that is consistent with the universal suffrage principles of the country and with the self-determination efforts of our other territorial brothers and sisters like Puerto Rico. Congressman, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for your questions. I am going to keep the question order open for a couple more seconds. We don't have anyone else lined up for questions. Last call for questions to our media partner. I have a follow-up. I have a follow-up question. Uh, Congressman, since uh, the post already opened the, the politics angle, right? <laughs> so if you do decide to run for governor, uh, who would you like to be your running mate? I don't know. It, it would need to be somebody who, who has the same philosophy. Um, we're not going to do the political thing, you know, where we try and you know, I think that a lot of politicians and political advisors don't do the people of Guam justice when they try and, and create these political marriages of convenience for the sake of trying to win a political angle. Um, the people of Guam, I believe, are, are, are at a place where they're going to want um, leadership that makes sense um, and leadership that is um, uh, um, something that they can, you know, th they can have an expectation of and have the confidence that expectation is going to be realized. So uh, as far as running mates, I, that, I think that that conversation is very premature, um, given the fact that we are um, at this time even still considering the, um, the, uh, the candidacy. Um, but I, I do want to assure the public that, that if we do um, make this decision, which we are uh, heavily leaning towards, um, I really would be honored to have uh, a running mate who is a good manager, uh, who has a proven track record, um, somebody that the people of Guam are going to be able to look to and know that they're going to deliver on the work that they do and in the statements that they make. That's something that we focused on uh, in my candidacy uh, as a senator and as a congressman. And it's something that um, we're going to want any partner that we work with to, to be able to um, uh, reliably uh, deliver for, for the people that we work for. So I don't know, Jerry, but, um, but it's definitely going to be, uh, it's definitely going to be uh, somebody that, that, that is not just, you know, we're not just doing things for political purposes. We're not just trying to create a sexy ticket. This is going to be something that's gonna put in a lot of work for the people if it's something that you know, we're, called, we're called to do it, uh, uh, in the end. Also, Congressman, uh, you had your issues with the Democratic Party of Guam, right? So if you do decide to run, uh, will you run under the Democratic banner or run as a third party independent candidate? I've, I'm a Democrat by tradition, Jerry. Um, my grandfather, my grandfather was a Democrat, and um, you know, I I I carry his name in my name. Uh, the FQ is Franklin Kizigua, you know, and so uh, we, we we try our very best to to not make things be about party. Um, I am very disappointed that the party. Um, leadership that they've elected is you know there's i guess some that are are, are um noteworthy but there's others that i just don't understand i don't understand what kind of message we're trying to send to the people um by by doing that but you know the party politics has um has i think while i was while i was a local legislator the party politics was already starting to get you know was already starting to get ugly and i think that it's only gotten uglier um, and that's why we don't focus on that. I think that um, the party, the, the party um, question is is not something that that should be foremost in our minds when we're um, considering taking on that role and considering uh, serving the people. So, and in all honesty, Jerry, I I really don't think the people of Guam either would 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 care too much, <laughs> you know, what kind of party their candidates were running under at this time. They just want someone who's going to go in there. And, and, and do something to make things better finally uh, after, after, you know, the, the many disappointments that, that, that they're having to deal with. So um, I, I, I'm a Democrat by tradition. I, I do want to make it very plain that uh, the Biden administration and the Democratic leadership of the House and the Senate 
are the ones that are making all of these opportunities possible for the people of Guam. Um, and we are part of that, uh, being a part of um, the Democratic Party um, in the federal government. And so um, I do want to absolutely thank my, uh, my federal Democratic counterparts, uh, my speaker, my majority leader, my majority whip, um, Leader Schumer, um, and the Biden administration, Vice President Harris. Um, all these things that we're talking about today, um, SSI for territories, getting Medicaid for, for Guam, um, us having resolved EITC, all the billions in federal relief, all the pandemic unemployment assistance, um, all the assistance that we're able to reach into and, and, and provide to our, our private sector to keep them going with PPP, um, all those things have been uh, driven by a democratic agenda federally. If only we can have that kind of, um, that kind of you know, drive uh, on the democratic agenda locally, my what, a, my what a wonderful sight that would be. But that notwithstanding, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, well, um, I'm absolutely committed to the party that I'm a part of right now, and I don't see that changing in the near future. And one last question, sir. Uh, if you do decide to throw your hat into the ring, uh, when will you have to resign? Uh, do you have to resign from Congress? And uh, what would the time frame for that be? Uh, I don't. I. I, I don't. I don't know. We haven't really dug into it that much. <laughs> you know, we're focusing on, on what we got to do here. So, um, yeah, I, you know, to make those kind of statements are, are, are presumptuous in, in the sense that it implies that we're, you know, we're pulling the trigger and we have a, a time frame in mind. And I think I made it very clear that we're, we're not there. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely look into those things and answer those questions um, when the time comes. But as of now, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a little premature. Okay. Thank you, Congressman. Sure, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Congressman, that concludes the question order for this second round. Do we have any more questions? If not, Congressman, I go ahead and yield it back to you. Thank you, T. I, I do want to um, recognize um, uh, a few more um, individuals. I want to recognize my family for, for the incredible sacrifices that they've been making um, for me to be able to, to make time for all of this. Uh, my daughter even, um, I said I needed a pen and she said, Daddy, use my unicorn pen. So I got her, her unicorn pen here from my notes. Um, I also have my management team on this call. I asked them to, to be present on this call um, because, you know, I wanted them to hear it, you know, in first person, uh, how grateful I am for all the sacrifices they make. Um, you know, I come in and I put in 150% and I expect from them at least 125. And uh, they make extraordinary sacrifices for us to be able to um, ultimately line up these kind of outcomes. And I just wanted to um, absolutely recognize them and thank them for their tireless work, um, putting up with me messaging them uh, at all hours of the day, seven days a week. Um, and then I finally wanted to, um, of course, recognize um, the people of Guam for uh, their advocacy and, and just, you know, they're on top of things in a way politically that I've never seen. And that takes me into my final thank you, which is to you, the media partners. Uh, you guys have been engaging the public um, on, on many important issues. You've been involving them, asking very hard questions um, across the political spectrum and uh, helping to really shape a, a, a culture of expectation that um, is really giving no elected official the, the wiggle room to be able to um, talk their way out of delivering on what our people expect. And, and that is a critical function that you folks play. Um, you, play you, 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 you carry that torch um, in every um, engagement with elected officials to include myself. And um, our, people, our people owe you a debt of gratitude for the work that you do in, in making your time and your effort uh, available for them uh, to ultimately make us, make, make us accountable. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for that. I wanna thank the people of Guam, um, my family and my team. It's been a lot of work and um, it's, it, it's been an honor serving you and working with you. So thank you all very much. And I guess we'll go ahead and, and conclude. Thank you so much, T. Thank you, Congressman.